Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our third online meetup. Uh, this is a very special meetup for us. Uh, we have people from Google's Android team joining us. And we have sessions around Android 11, as well as a live Q&A sessions for everyone to answer their questions. So uh, we, I'll soon add Jet and Romain to this stream. And they're going to talk about what's new in Android 11. Uh, one request for you, if you have any questions regarding Android 11 or Android in general, please start uh, putting them in YouTube comments so that uh, we can have them answered in the uh, Q&A session, which will be followed by this session. So yeah, just let me add check. Hi, check. Hi. Uh, yeah, please uh, introduce. <laughs> I'll, how about if I introduce me? I'm, I'm better yes. at introducing me than introducing <laughs> anyone else. Hi, I'm Chet. I'm Chet Haas from the Android Developer Relations team. Thanks for coming to the event, and thanks for having us here. Yeah. Thank you, Jack. Uh, hi, Roman. Hi. I'm Orna from the Android Toolkit team. Uh, thanks for having us. It's really weird. It feels like there's, are we sure there are people watching this? It's yeah, just yeah, us. <laughs> I feel they still just talking to my screen, to chat, really. Good. So uh, we'll get started with your session. Uh, let me just add your slides. OK. Uh, I'm going to remove myself from stream, and then over to you guys. All right. So welcome to what's new in Android. I think we already introduced ourselves, so we can probably just go to the next slide. First of all, I did want to point out that the last time I gave a talk in Bangalore, it took me like 97 days to get there, and I was incredibly jet lagged. And so now we're doing this. Uh, late in the evening hour time so that I feel exactly the same, completely out of time here. So I've always wanted to uh, to, to go to India. I guess I finally did. Yes. It doesn't look that uh, different. Took not quite as long to get there this time. Um, so the question is, what is new? Uh, first of all, what's new about this talk? Normally, we give this talk once a year at Google I.O. Uh, it's usually Roma, it's usually me, and it's usually Dan Sandler, who is not going to join us tonight uh, because it's even later in Cambridge, where he Did lives. Did you ask him? I, I didn't, actually. It was a, it was a secret. Don't tell him that, we're that doing this. Uh, but otherwise, the talk is essentially the same as it has been since, what, 2011, the first time we gave a talk like this, which means we are going to talk about the platform. We're going to talk about the larger changes that happened in Android 11 are still happening in Android 11, since we're now in the beta period of that release. We'll also talk a little bit about Android Studio and see what's happening in the tool space. And we'll also talk about some of the unbundled libraries and APIs that we offer outside of the platform. So uh, yeah. A good way to think about this talk, it's the talk where uh, Chet and Romain try to explain things they do not understand. <laughs> no, 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 you're not supposed to give that secret away. No, 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 no. We, we know all of this stuff, cold, absolutely. I wrote these slides, I must know it, right? <laughs> Let's start with UI, my favorite area, probably your favorite area as well, Roma, and, and everybody else's as well. Um, so first of all, let's talk about window insets. This is a very old API um, that has a lot of functionality that didn't really make sense. It was difficult to deal with. It gives you information about the insets that are available, the constraints that are on the screen, but it does not give you the information you actually want to know, which is what is the window that has those insets? And by gosh, where is that IME keyboard anyway? Um, so we have changed the API quite substantially in Android 11. We've deprecated almost all of the old methods that were there, all of the ones that didn't really tell you all the information that you wanted. Um, and instead, we introduced a lot of new API to this class uh, that does give you that information. So now you can ask for insets information that is specific to the windows on the screen that you really care about. Um, so things like, where is the status bar? And how big is the navigation bar? And where is that IME after all? So the way that it works, here's a little bit of sample code. You set this window insets listener. Inside that, you can get the window insets object. And then you can actually see if the IME keyboard is visible. Who knew that this was so difficult? That's Wait. right, everybody did. It took us only 12 years to, do, to, to provide this API? This is, this is like two new methods so far. So yeah, it took a while. Uh, yeah, people have been asking for this kind of functionality for a while, and, and now it's here. So 
Uh, also, you can uh, once you know that the keyboard is visible, you can actually get information about the insets. You can find out where it is and how big it is. So the question is, why did we do this now? Insets has been there for a while. Well, the answer is at least partially to enable IME animations, my personal favorite feature in the release. So finally, you can synchronize the content in your application with the motion of the keyboard. So previously, the keyboard would animate in, it was a nice smooth animation, but you couldn't smoothly animate your content because you didn't know when the keyboard was coming. You would just get a message that told you the new size that everything was, and then you had to react to it. So your application is snapping, while the keyboard is animating in, not a great user experience. So now you can actually synchronize, you can get information about the keyboard and you can even control that keyboard animation. So let's look at a little bit of a sample. So uh, these illustrations come from a sample. I'll, I'll put up a URL later. Chris Baines wrote the sample to show how to do some of this stuff. There's two versions of the control of the keyboard going on here. The one on the left, the keyboard is doing sort of the default motion, which is it is snapping into place. It is animating in so you know you tap on the edit text and it automatically animates in at whatever its normal animation rate is and the application can get that information and animate its content appropriately so it is reacting to the keyboard changes and changing itself to synchronize with the motion of the keyboard on the right it's even more interesting the the user is actually dragging the information dragging the content um, in the application, and then the application is controlling frame by frame the animation of the keyboard itself because it has full control over this. So we'll take a look at a little bit of sample code to show how that works. So this is the animation that was on the left there. The keyboard automatically animates in and uh, the application listens in to see what's going on. So you set a listener, this callback object there, and then you can basically listen to uh, the motion lifecycle uh, to figure out where that keyboard is and what you can do about it in your application content. On the other side, um, on the right-hand side of that sample, we saw the user driving it with his gesture as they are scrolling the content, the keyboard smoothly scrolls in. So you can set up an animation. You can drive it to be set and forget, but in this case, we actually wanted to drive it to be gesture-driven, reacting to the user input instead. Uh, so we say, well, we're animating the keyboard here. It's going to be infinite duration. We don't know how long the animation is going to run because we're just driving it as the user is pulling the content up and down. Uh, letting our interpolation for the same reason. We're just going to be going frame by frame anyway. Uh, you can have a cancellation signal in case you need to kill it in the middle. Uh, and then you can find out about lifecycle events of the animation. Um, so go ahead and check out Chris Baines's sample code um, for more information so you can start creating these experiences in your application. Still in the UI area, we have this whole area that we call people, which is about surfacing content about the people that are important in your life uh, as a user of one of these devices. Um, it's clear that this is most of the stuff that, that people do on their devices is interact with friends and family and colleagues and the ability to get back to those conversations quickly is kind of important. So if you were in a chat application and then you're using something else, let's say you're in email, and then you wanna get back to that, you get a notification from them. And then you have to go through several clicks, maybe go through the home screen, you run this application again, deep, 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 and then finally you're in the conversation. Wouldn't it be nice instead if you could just automatically get back to that conversation? And that's what you can do now with the new conversations capability. Um, so here we see a sample notification. We have a new area of notifications in the notification panel called conversations. Uh, and these are the pieces of information that were propagated from uh, messaging applications for the people that this user wants to interact with. You can long press on one of these items and that'll bring up a settings panel where they can set more information. How do I want to be notified uh, with you know, vibration mode or, or ringtone or whatever when this particular person contacts me. So you can specialize that. You can also set the priority. So you can say, actually, this conversation is the most important one. It is about you know the education, the schools that my kids are in or whatever. So please put that one at the top of the list. So you can change the priority and then that actually changes the ordering within the notification panel according again to the people, right? It's all about the people. So uh, the way that you do this is you create this person object. Uh, person is not a new API. I think it came out in Android 10 uh, and create this information and then create a shortcut, a long lived shortcut um, that you will then populate a notification with. So you push the shortcut 
And then you use messaging style. Here's an important requirement. You have to use messaging style now. Maybe you already are. This is also not a new API, um, but it is a requirement of the conversations uh, approach. And then you build the notification with the shortcut ID that you created earlier up above for the long lived um, shortcut. All right, so once you have that information, you're already in the notification panel, you're already in this conversations area, you can also propagate it to an area that takes place all over the UI, the new capabilities, Bubbles. So Bubbles actually existed in Android 10 already, but as a developer option so that application developers like you could start playing with it, but it was not actually propagated to users yet because it wasn't quite ready. Well, now it is. It is there. It's full-fledged feature. You can use it uh, and propagate this information into bubbles, and then the user needs to opt in. So the first time you ask them to uh, have a bubble in their UI, then they need to agree to that experience. So you're not just popping bubbles all over the place uh, where maybe the user doesn't want them. Here we see a sample that was written by Yuichi on the team. Uh, you can see a bubble there on the upper left. Uh, and when you tap that bubble, uh, then you get this little mini activity in place, right? It's in situ, it's right there. Um, so what do you do to actually create that experience? Uh, first of all, here's a little bit more information. Uh, oh, I should point out that this is basically a replacement for what most people were using system alert window for. System alert window is a really heavy hammer for doing this kind of stuff. It populates the UI with a transparent window that rides over everything, and then they'd put this little piece of information in there. I'm thinking like Facebook, uh, the messenger chat heads, I believe, use this and, and other similar approaches elsewhere, because it was really the only way to populate a UI that rode on top of everything all over the place. Well, instead, use the Bubbles API. Stop using system alert window um, because this is really a better approach. Uh, that the system alert window API could be abused by applications. So this is, you know, because there was a good use case for this API, we are making it harder to use the, the abusive API. And now instead you have this. Yes. Uh, exactly. Uh, so how do you create these bubbles? Uh, you're going to use the notification API, um, which you're probably doing already. You just need to add a little bit more information about it. So there's a little bit of metadata about the bubbles information that you need to propagate. And then there's information about this little mini activity that's going to pop up when they actually tap on the bubble. So first of all, you say, okay, I've got this new activity here and it needs to be resizable because you'll notice in the sample that we saw earlier, it was a smaller activity. It actually popped up on top of that, uh, the, that UI exactly in place when they were on the home screen, right? Um, so it needs to be resizable and then you need to create the intent for that activity. Uh, you have this shortcut info that you're probably already creating already, especially if you're doing the conversation stuff. And then you create the bubble metadata and you create a notification populate that with the bubble metadata and you're good to go. Um, more information about this is in uh, one of the talks that came out with the launch is called What's New in System UI. There's also more information, um, more content that was published this week. This is the first week of 11 weeks in Android and the first week was all about people. So there's more content on all of this stuff. Um, there's uh, the sample that we saw the screenshot from that's on GitHub called Bubbles Kotlin. So check that out. And also we recorded a, a ADB podcast with uh, engineers on the Bubbles team a few weeks ago, and that's posted uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, episode 140 called Bubbles. Um, so I would like to talk about privacy, um, but I really don't think I should. And in fact, I really don't think I will because someone else is going to. There's a talk right after this from Joe Birch. So Mama and I are going to give this talk, and then we're going to do a QA, and and then Joe Birch is going to give a talk um, that is adapting your apps for Android 11 privacy changes. And he's going to go way more in depth than I was about to. So I'm not going to talk about this stuff at all. So stay I mean, tuned, listen to Joe. It's what yeah. I was saying earlier. Like, it's good that they sent someone who knows what they're talking about for this part of your topic, because it's very important. So I'm glad that someone else is doing it. Yes. Uh, all right. So one of the other things that we focused on in this release, all releases, but there really were quite a few things in Android 11, um, was stuff for developers, specifically for making your development lives easier. One of my favorites, of course, is Wi-Fi debugging because frankly, there are never enough USB ports. I took this picture, it's basically of my desk that's sitting in front of me right now and it looks even worse now. There's one dongle there with three cables plugged into it because I didn't have enough USB ports. And now I actually have two daisy chain dongles because I had yet another USB device to plug in. And again, there were not enough USB ports. So we created the capability to talk to your devices over Wi-Fi instead. Uh, so very cool. You don't necessarily need 
uh, that USB port to plug into it. It is a little bit of a manual process right now. You need to enable it through the UI. Uh, and there's also command line options to actually um, set this thing up, uh, pair and connect with the device. However, the good news is I think it's Android 4.2. Uh, the Canary that just came out has a capability. Um, so early version of playing with it within Android Studio, which is always the long-term goal. It's just not quite there yet. So if you want to play with it in Studio, uh, get 4.2. Otherwise, you can use this on whatever Android Studio uh, release you are currently using. Uh, another way we made things easier was by adding even more annotations in the platform APIs. We've been doing this in previous releases in a couple of different ways. So in each release, when we add a new annotation, it's one of these recently annotations, recently nullable or recently non-null. And what that means is we just added this annotation. We don't want to break your build but we do want to tell you that you're doing something wrong. So when you are calling code that is not obeying the contract that is in these annotations, then we will give you a warning in your build. On the other hand, if we already had a recently annotation in there, maybe we've upgraded it in this release to be either nullable or non-null. And now when you call that code uh, with uh, other code that doesn't obey the contract, we will break your build. That will break right there because you know what? It's way better to break the build than to break the runtime. So please catch it at development time. And we are hopefully helping you to do that. Uh, another way that we're helping is through crash reasons reporting. One of the hardest things to do in debugging and fixing your problems is finding out why they crashed in the real world, right? We all have a set of devices, emulators and, and hardware devices that we use. And we have you know this host device and we have apps installed. And we, we try to mimic a real environment, but there is no way that you can mimic the real environment everywhere in the universe of all these different kinds of device setups and people with different apps installed and different memory configurations. Um, and so what we've done is we've made it easier for you to detect what actually happened in the field. So there's an API to find out what happened to your application, and then you can uh, upload that to your server and take a look at it and see what is going on. So you can get historical process, exit reasons, and then walk through those reasons, the uh, collection information that we give you and find out, did I run out of memory? Uh, was there an actual crash? Was there an ANR? Um, now maybe uh, you would do this, you, you certainly could do this manually in your application. Uh, maybe you already use a crash service like Crashlytics or whatever, um, and uh, that's totally fine. These crash services may also take advantage of an API like this um, under the hood eventually. For example, I believe the information on ANRs is really hard to get. They kind of need to connect the dots, uh, but this gives them much more tangible information about that. Um, so hopefully good both for developers as well as for library developers um, that, uh, that you may be using uh, more indirectly to get this information. Uh, GWP ASAN is an advancement on something that we offered in Android 10 called HW ASAN. Um, HW ASAN was about using a different memory allocator basically to, to put an overhead layer, uh, an extra layer on top of memory allocation so that if you try to access memory incorrectly, let's say you free an object and then you try to access that memory, we will detect it because there's that extra layer of error checking going on, which is great at development time, but it adds uh, both a lot of memory because now you're adding like all these other methods all over the place um, for allocations in this in the the heap, uh, the native heap. It, it also adds runtime overhead because there's this extra step to go through every time you allocate and free. Um, and so we've taken a different approach with GWP ASAN, and you can use it in the real world. Um, so instead of being laid over every memory access, it's um, it's sampled instead. You can think of it as sort of the memory allocator equivalent of the sampling profile where it doesn't measure everything. It just measures a few things here and there. And if you happen to trip over one of those, then you're going to get really information about what you were doing and why in the real world. And it's so low overhead. I think the size of the library is about 60K and the runtime overhead is negligible. Um, so you can feel free to bundle this with your application and ship it out there. Um, so I should point out that this is for native developer, developers. So if you're using Android SDK at the, the Java API, Kotlin API level, not for you. Um, but if you are doing native development, like game development, uh, probably worth looking into. Uh, and then all, all, also the cool thing about this is the reports are automatically uploaded to the Play dashboard. So what happens is when you actually access one of these things incorrectly, it will automatically crash, which it may have done anyway. And then it's going to log a nice report for you, and that'll go in your dashboard. 
So to enable this, you just add this into your manifest, GWP ASAN mode equals always. Um, and then when you crash, you're gonna get a, a error report that looks a lot like this, maybe with a larger font size. ADB incremental is about being able to install your application faster, which um, we'd all like to do, but if your application is huge, we'd really like to do that, right? So you can use command line uh, operations. And if you have a really huge APK, it can save you up to like 10 times in install time. Um, so imagine if you have like a game with really huge assets, it's two gigs and you've got to push this thing. You got to fix one line of code and then push two gigs of data down to the device uh, can take a while, right? Um, but now you can get much faster pushes uh, and you can get even faster than that if you just want um, the, the code that is uh, that you need uh, to be playable. Um, so and check that out, yeah. And if you want to, to further improve your uh, ADB push, uh, uh, Fabien Sanglar uh, had a really interesting talk at the Android Dev Summit last year. Uh, it was a short talk on USB cables. Turns out that not all USB cables are as good as, as one another. So it's only five minutes. Uh, I recommend watching it so you can find a better cable. It helps. Does it also help if you, like, should you have your device like downstream of your laptop? Should, for the for does the, gravity matter? Oh yeah, totally. Okay, all right. I, I thought that's how it worked, yeah. Uh, so the way it works is you need to sign your APK with this uh, new approach and then do an install dash dash incremental and away you go and it only installs what it needs to. Um, there are usually behavior changes in every release, especially as we make privacy changes and we lock down the information that applications can access so that we can protect user data and make it more transparent to users. But we're taking a couple of approaches in this release that should make it easier for everybody to adopt these changes. For one thing, most of the changes that we're talking about in privacy or that Joe Birch is about to talk about in privacy uh, are only going to take place when you target this API level. Um, so you will target it eventually, this or later. Um, but for now, if you are not doing that yet in this release, um, then for the most part, the behavior changes will not affect you. Uh, also, you have the ability to toggle these behavior changes uh, one by one to see how they affect you. So you can test this uh, much easier at build time. You could already do this for various things through the command line, but the new cool thing that we've enabled this time is there is a new UI for doing that. So we can see that UI here. If you go into developer options, you can see all the toggles that you can access directly, um, or you can continue using the command line. Uh, so here, if you do the uh, the disable command here, then you could see the UI. Let's do that again. Watch that UI. Wow, that's amazing. All right, so you use your command line or you use the UI. We're just trying to make it easier to adopt these changes going forward. All right, so now we're going to talk about the real interesting stuff, the only interesting stuff, graphics and media. Uh, so Chet is driving the slide. So Chet, uh, I'm just going to say what I have to say. You'll figure out when to advance, okay? Like that? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. First up, uh, NDK image decoders. So on the platform, we have a number of image decoders, you know, for GIF files, PNG, WebP, JPEG, and so on. Traditionally, you access those through the uh, image decoder API or bitmap factory. The problem is that when you're writing native code, decoding uh, an image is a little awkward because you are in native code. You have to upcall through JNI to the Java layer, make your call there, but the Java layer We'll go back to JNI because our image decoders on the platform are written native. So there's a lot of overhead for absolutely no reason. So a lot of apps are bundling their own decoding libraries. I know a lot of games do that, which increase the size of your APK. So the good news now is that we have NDK APIs for image decoders. So there's a bit of code to show you how easy it is to use. First of all, you point to an asset uh, with an asset descriptor, you get back an image decoder. Uh, then from that, uh, on that decoder, you can set the format of the bitmap that you want. Uh, for instance, if you need high precision, you can use the format RGBA float 16 instead of the uh, 8888 that we use traditionally. And finally, you just need to allocate your buffer for to, to host the bitmap, uh, which means it's also e extremely trivial to reuse chunks of memory when you're in native code, um, when you decode multiple images in a row, for instance. Uh, and finally, you just call the decoder, and boom, you have this beautiful image in the top right. I don't, I'm not sure what it is. It looks like a big nose. Uh, it's a it's a teapot. It's a standard graphics 3D object. Right. Um, all right. We've also added support for animated HEIF files. So HEIF or H-E-I-F um, is a 
more efficient uh, compression format. It's kind of like a super JPEG if you want, like higher quality, smaller size, definitely better than, than GIF or GIF, however you pronounce it. Um, so now you can, uh, and GIF, the GIF format supports animated files, just like in, in GIF as opposed to PNG, for instance. Uh, and we can load this animated GIF file through the animated image drawable API, just like animated GIF. Uh, and let me show you actually some code to so you understand how it works. So you go into image decoder. So image decoder is our new API. It's kind of like the, the successor to bitmap factor. It's much better. Um, it's an API that makes a lot more sense. So you create a source from, from image decoder pointing to a file. Uh, and then looking at the at the drawable that you that you decode, you can check the type of the drawable. And if it is an animated image drawable, you can call the start method to start playing the animation. Uh, for those of you who need to use sound from NDK, uh, we had this API called OpenSLES. Uh, I assume it stands for Open Sound Library, just like OpenGL. It's now deprecated. Instead, we have a library called Obo. It's an unbundled C++ library, and it was designed from the ground up from the ground up for high performance audio and low latency. So it's very important if you're building, for instance, a, a synthesizer or if you want to you know to, to have an app that generates music on the fly it works all the way back to api 16 and it's open source you can find it on github um, so you don't even need to wait for android 11 to deprecate OpenSL. you can already adopt obo uh, and i believe uh actually that's our next slide we had an episode on precisely that uh, of our android developers backstage episode 135 so if you want to know more about that library please listen to that episode uh, then we have support for variable refresh rate. Um, so since the early days of Android, all the panels, all the displays on phones run at about uh, 60 hertz, more or less. Um, and that means that for, for applications that run their own render loop, let's say you have a game or you have you know, a heavy media uh, application, you're going to drive the, 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 the screen yourself. The problem is that sometimes you're doing just a little too much work and you can't hit the frame rate of 60 frames per second. Uh, and the problem is that because on Android, we don't let you uh, do tearing, the only you, you will fall back to 30 frames per second. And it gets particularly bad when your application is on the cusp of being able to do 60 frames per second. So that means that your application will go back and forth between 60 and 30, and it's a really unpleasant experience for the user. So now we have a number of devices, that, for instance, the Pixel 4 that, supports, uh, that support better frame rate, like 90 hertz or 120 hertz. And on desktop and laptops now, those those refresh rate, refresh rates go all the way to 300. So I assume this will come to phones uh, at some point in the near future. What's very interesting with uh, some of those panels, uh, not all of them, is that for some of them, the system can dictate the refresh rate. So we're not locked to 60 or 90 or 120. The application can tell the system, for instance, with surface that send frame rate, what is the frame rate you'd like to have? So let's say that you can only hit 45, uh, 45 frames per second. You can tell the system, the system will look at all the window, windows are on screen and will decide based on the different information from all the applications what the frame rate of the display should be. So chances are, if you build a full, uh, full screen application like a game, uh, you're going to be the only one visible and you're going to get the frame rate you want on devices that can support this kind of, this kind of uh, features. NDK thermal APIs. Um, so this is an API we had available uh, in the Java layer, I think starting in Android 10 or 9, maybe one of the two. Um, and they can be important because um, not all developers are aware that when you use the device heavily, like when you run a lot of computations or if you turn on a lot of the, the, the computing blocks of the device, you're using for instance the GPU, the screen, the sensors, the camera at the same time, heats build up. And to avoid uh, problems like the phone melting, uh, there are built-in protections in the system. So when, the, when the, the heat reaches a certain limit, the device goes into thermal throttling. So it starts lowering the clocks of the different computing blocks, so it lowers the performance of your application. Uh, and the problem is that there was no way for you to know that. And it can be really useful in the game, for instance, you know, when the device is about to get into that state, maybe you can lower the resolution or stop drawing some of the fancy effects so you can maintain your frame rate uh, even, even though you are in, under a, a thermal throttling. And of course, sometimes you know thermal throttling can be uh, much heavier than that. Uh, for instance, the other day I left my phone outside. It was uh, 95 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in California. Uh, I went back to it and it was off, telling me that it was too hot. So I had to put it in the freezer for a few minutes to be able to use it uh, right away. Anyway, here's a here's a. I learned this from my wife recently that the a lot of the dashboard mounts for a phone sit on the dashboard, 
sit on the dashboard, not just like in it, but on the dashboard. And what do you use with your phone? What do you do with your phone in your car? You navigate, right? So you've got the screen on, you're running a really expensive application that takes a lot of processing power and it's sitting in the sun the entire time, the hot California sun, bad, bad combination. Bad idea. <laughs> Um, anyway, so now we have APIs uh, in Jedi. Um, so you register a listener, you will get a status. Some of them are pretty scary. If you receive the shutdown or emergency status, uh, you really need to stop what, what, what you're doing. Um, something bad's going to happen. The critical status is a little more interesting. That means we are about to lower the performance of the device, and you can do something about it. So as you can see on screen, it's super simple. Like in a couple lines of code, you get the thermal manager. You register your listener. And when you're done, you can unregister your listener and release the manager. Uh, Angle is a, a kind of layer for OpenGL, yes, that has been used by um, Chrome for a long, long time. For instance, it's used on Chrome uh, by Chrome on Windows to run OpenGL yes, on top of DirectX so that Chrome only needs to target a single graphics API. So now it's available on Android. We've been working on making OpenGL ES run on top of Vulkan. So the idea here is that there would be only one OpenGL ES implementation that you know, we provide as part of the system, which should help reduce the number of bugs or differences between different devices, different drivers. Uh, it is not quite ready for production yet, uh, but in the uh, developer settings, you can turn it on if you want for the non-core application. So if you have an application that's using OpenGL, you can turn on Angle to see how your application will behave. You might run into bugs, please file them. You might see uh, a huge drop in performance. Please also tell us uh, that it's happening because it should not be happening. All right, so that's for graphics and media, uh, but there are some other interesting APIs as part of the platform. The first one is NN API, that's neural networks. It's a C API to be able to execute neural nets. Uh, so there's a number of new features available. Uh, if, for instance, if and while, uh, you can now do branches and loops. Uh, oh, no. Networks. Uh, there is one new feature. I have no idea what it does, but it's called Heart Swish. Uh, at first, I thought it was about basketball. Uh, like, you know, he goes for the score, Heart Swish. Uh, but it's not. It's about neural networks. Uh, and I'm sure that, you know, if you do machine learning and neural nets, uh, you'll be very excited by those new opcodes. Uh, there's also more control over how the, the execution of your neural net takes place. In particular, you have fence compute, so you can better order a chain of dependencies without involving the CPU. And the new memory domains uh, let you avoid unnecessary copies between, let's say, the, C the, the GPU, an NPU, or the CPU, so you have better control of where data lives. Uh, 5G, so this is coming uh, to you know, a lot of phones and networks out there. So 5G gives you lower latency network and much, much more bandwidth. Uh, so it can be very interesting for applications to be aware of the state of the network because they before they take advantage of those new features uh, provided by 5G. In particular, you want to know if you're going to cost the user a lot of money because if they pay by the gigabyte, let's say, um, and you start using all the, the bandwidth of 5G, uh, you're going to cost the user a lot of money. Uh, you can also check the actual speed of the of the network link. Uh, so you can see an example on screen. You can check if the uh, if the network is metered, or, or you can ask for the actual bandwidth of the network before you do something in your application. Uh, then we have a new feature, the biometric authenticator strength. So different devices have different biometric identification systems. Uh, there's 2D face unlock, there's 3D face unlock, there's fingerprints. Uh, I think there's eye scanners, and I'm sure there will be uh, more things uh, later on. So now there is a way, and, and those different devices, these different ways of authenticating uh, don't have the same level of security. For instance, a 2D face unlock is easier to fool than the 3D face unlock that makes sure that you know it's an actual like 3D face and you blink and so on. So now what you can do in your code when you get a reference to the biometric manager, you can specify the strength of the auth authentication that your app requires. So then you can ask the manager uh, whether or not the device can support this kind of, of, of authentication. If it does, then you can craft your intent. And in the intent, you can specify the strengths that you want. So for instance, you could imagine a banking application requiring some level of security before you can access you know, your money. Um, and if you're on a device that does not support the, the strengths that you seek, uh, then you can either ask the user to go turn on the, the feature in their, their settings or just to you know, log in in a different way or you know, whatever else you want to do in your application. 
Uh, autofill and keyboard integration. Um, that one is a, is an interesting one. So when you are um, when you have a, a different input field in your application, we have this autofill service to automatically enter your address, your credit card, your login and password, for instance. So you have suggestions that are contextual. But you also have a keyboard, and the keyboard has its own contextual suggestions. Uh, you know, the autocomplete. So wouldn't be nice if both types of suggestions showed up in the same place. Uh, so this is what we did with this integration. So there are, there are two parts to this. There's new APIs for the keyboards themselves, so they can receive the suggestions that they should display from uh, the autofill providers. And you know, most of the time, those autofill providers are password managers, uh, you know, like LastPass or 1Password and so on. And of course, this needs to be secure. So what's interesting in this implementation is that the autofill system does not send the actual data to the keyboard. It sends the UI to present in a secure fashion. So the keyboard does not have access to the secure autofill data. Uh, you can see examples on screen here. Uh, for instance, here, when you're signing in, you have suggestions at the top of the keyboard for your email and password. You can have suggestions for your credit card or for a street address, uh, if that's what the app requires you to enter. So the way it works is pretty simple. Like I said, there are two sides to it. Um, if you're writing an IME, uh, a keyboard, um, the autofill system will call on create inline suggestion request, telling you that the, 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 the autofill wants to provide suggestions. So you return a request. And in that request, you can, you can um, tell the system, OK, what locales you support uh, and how many uh, suggestions you can present to the user. Then when you're done, you will receive the on inline suggest suggestions response. Uh, and that is the UI that you need to display. On the other side, if you're a password manager, uh, you have this on-fill request method that you implement. In that method, you craft a, a data set. And in that data set, you can create inline presentations. And those are the UI bits that will appear inside the keyboard. And when you're done creating your data set, you, get, you just uh, create a, a response and you send it to the AIM. So that was it for the platform, uh, but of course you must be you, you must be used to it by now. We have a lot of other things that we ship uh, uh, outside of the platform. Uh, the first one is Jetpack. So now we have uh, actually Chat. I think your slide is outdated. We have more than eighty libraries. I think it's something like one hundred and fifty artifacts, uh, and we release them very often. Actually, we have a release train every two weeks. So not all libraries ship every two weeks, but every two weeks we do ship something. Uh, it's a lot of libraries. And recently, actually, uh, last week, we've had a, a series of new libraries. So the first one is Hilt. It's a new uh, dependency injection API built for Android on top of Dagger. So it extends Dagger, and it has features that are specific to Android to make it easier for you to use Dagger. And this is now the solution that we recommend as the Android team for dependency injection on Android. Of course, if you have something else that you use and like, feel free to keep using it. Uh, but if you don't know what you should choose or if you're writing a new app, you should take a look at Hilt. Uh, Paging 3, it's a new version of our paging library. It's now written entirely in Kotlin. It's our first library rewritten from the ground up in Kotlin. And it has supports for core routines. App Startup. Um, so a lot of libraries to hook into the lifecycle of the application register content providers. The problem is that every content provider that you register in the system um, slows down the startup of your application by a little bit. I don't remember the exact numbers that we're talking about, you know, 10, 20 milliseconds, something like that. And every content provider that you register for that purpose is slowing down your, the startup of your application. So now instead, we have this library, and it itself creates one content provider, but then it exposes an API so that you can participate in the lifecycle uh, without having to create yet another content provider. It's a pretty small library, so I encourage you to take a look at it. And finally, Camera X uh, has reached beta status. So Camera X is our, uh, um, is our new camera API that works across multiple versions of Android. It provides uh, features that are specific to different devices. It has the concept of extension. For instance, on a device that has HDR, you may have access to it via the Camera X API and makes things uh, a lot simpler in general. We also have uh, Jetpack Compose. Uh, so you, you've probably heard of it, but Jetpack Compose is a new UI toolkit uh, that we're working on. It's written entirely in Kotlin. Uh, it's based on the reactive programming model. And it's quite different from what you're used to. In Jetpack Compose, every widget is just a function. Uh, it's a very interesting model. It's super easy to use. And you know, I've been using the, uh, the Android UI toolkit for the past well, 12 or 13 years now. Uh, I wrote a, a good chunk of it. 
uh, and now I have a hard time using it uh, now that I'm used to Compose. It's, uh, it's a lot nicer, I think. It's not currently in alpha yet. Uh, our plan is to release an alpha later this summer, uh, but it is developed entirely in the open. So if you look at the AOSP repository, uh, you can see everything that's going on. And just like with Jetpack, we release a new uh, developer preview every two weeks. Uh, so we're currently at Dev 13. It's the Jetpack Compose Developer Preview 2. That's our marketing term. Uh, and there's going to be uh, Dev 14, I believe, next week. Um, I think, too, there, there's a what, sample and tutorial, the Jet News. Yes, we have sample and tutorials uh, on GitHub. If you go to developer.android.com slash jetpack slash compose, uh, you will have links to a code lab, the tutorials. Uh, we also did last week uh, as part of the Android 11 beta launch, uh, there was a, I, I did a video where I show some of the new features. If you want to see what it looks like, uh, it's a good, way, a good place to get started. Uh, Android Studio, we have three major releases for you. First of all, uh, 4.0 is now stable. Uh, it comes with a motion editor for motion layout. So motion layout is a way to create really complex animations as part of your UI. But you know, until now, you were doing it in code. And with motion editor, you have a visual tool to do that. And if there's one place where visual tools are extremely helpful, it's for animations. Uh, you can visualize all the states of your animation. You can scrub back and forth in the timeline. You can animate different properties. You have, uh, you have keyframes. It's a really, really powerful tool. We also have the layout inspector. Uh, it's, a, it's a replacement for Hierarchy Viewer, uh, better integrated in Android Studio. You can see all the layers in your application with a 3D view. Uh, it also works in uh, semi-real time. So whenever you make changes inside the application, let's say you navigate to a different screen, it refreshes almost right away. And my favorite feature is that it tells you, let's say you have a, a text view and the, the font size is 40. Uh, very often, you might have to spend quite a bit of time figuring out what style uh, that 40 number is coming from. So the layout inspector does that for you. All you do is click on the value and it takes you to the XML file that the, that the, that the value came from. Uh, we have 4.1 uh, Android Studio 4.1 beta. One of the big new features is the database inspector. So if you're using SQLite or Room, while your application is running, you can connect the database inspector and you can see everything that's happening in the database in real time. Uh, and it's really powerful because you can also make changes to the database. So if you make a change to the database and you use Room, your UI, your UI will react in real time as well. So it goes both ways. Um, again, if you look at the videos, that, if you watch the videos that we published last week, I gave a demo of the database inspector used in combination with, uh, with Compose. And finally, uh, 4.2 Canary. So it has the wireless debugging feature that Chet mentioned. And if you want to use Jetpack Compose, uh, until we hit alpha at the very least, uh, you have to use the latest Canary. So until now, you had to use 4.1 Canary, and now you have to use 4.2 Canary. Uh, so we'll stay in the, in, the, in the Canary branch. We've also done things uh, that are outside of Android 11. We have a new Android game SDK. It provides uh, native libraries from game developers. Uh, for instance, frame pacing, we talked about frame rate. And it's important to be able to produce frames as fast as possible. But it's equally important to present the frames at the right time. And this is something that can be very hard to get right. So the graphics team built that frame pacing library uh, to do that for you. Uh, trust me, uh, a colleague and I uh, had recreated the, this library ourselves in, our, in, in a rendering engine. You do not want to do that. Please use the library. Uh, Play asset delivery, delivery to distribute uh, large game assets. We have uh, better profilers in Android Studio. So we have a native memory profiler. We have a better integration with SysTrace. Uh, and you, you can also uh, access some of our uh, previews for other development tools. For instance, we have an extension for Visual Studio. We're working on a GPU inspector that will let you do some, some type of profiling for the GPU, which until now required uh, tools that were specific to the GPU that's on your device and that were difficult to use uh, across multiple devices. So check out d.android.com slash games if you want to know more. So that's, uh, oh, I was about to say that's, no, that's not quite it. There's one last thing, uh, Google Play. So when you publish your app, we have a new Play console. It's a complete redesign of the UI, uh, much easier to use, much nicer, nice, nicer visuals. Uh, you have a new section for the policy status, a new section to check the uh, acquisition reports to you know how you're acquiring your users and also to manage your team. So who has access to the console and who can publish or not. So it's currently in beta. If you want access, please check out play.google.com console uh, to know more. So that's really it. 
Uh, if you want to know more, uh, we have a bunch of launch videos that I just mentioned. You can see the URL on screen if you want to check them out. So we talk about design tools, system UI, uh, privacy, storage access, Kotlin, and so on. We also kickstarted this week the 11 weeks of Android. So for the next 10 weeks, uh, every week we're going to have a new theme. So we just had people and identity. It was about conversations and bubbles. Next week it's about uh, machine learning, and you can see the full uh, schedule on on the slide. Uh, and we're going to have videos, samples, uh, tutorials every week. Uh, so you'll probably be uh, tired of seeing chat uh, very soon because I believe he's going to MC a lot of it. Uh, and of course, we have Android 11 meetups all over the world. Uh, your, I believe you attend. We're doing one of them, right? Yes. Yes. All right. That makes sense. It's very recursive uh, reference. Yeah. So you probably don't need to attend another one, but if you have friends in other countries, let, let them know. Uh, they might be interested. Uh, and of course, Chad had to plug in uh, his. Uh, had to. Yeah, zero. dude, you need to find better URLs. Those are way too long. <laughs> I'm working on it. There, there should be anyway, a single URL. But uh, every couple of weeks, Chet has this uh, se this segment called "Now in Android." It's uh, basically a summary of everything that's going on in the world of Android, because a lot is happening. Uh, it's actually pretty hard to uh, even for us to like stay afloat. Um, so, and because Chet loves attention, he publishes articles, <laughs> videos with the same content, and a podcast with the same content. So if you want to hear the same thing three times, uh, you can. Uh, and that's it for us. And I think we're going to move on to a Q and A. First, we're going to pause awkwardly while they, ah, uh, right. That <laughs> yeah, wasn't yeah I am here. <laughs> so yeah, thanks uh, Jet and Ruben for this session. Yeah, we are going to pause awkwardly now. <laughs> so we're going to take a two minute break right now. And then we are going to return with Fireside Chat where we'll have more engineers joining us. So right. yeah, I'm gonna remove you from stream now. Right. Uh, hey everyone, so we are gonna take a, just a quick two minute break and then we are gonna return. So, thanks. Hey everyone. So we are now going to start our fireside session uh, where we will have uh, more engineers from uh, Google's Android team join us, including Yid Borar, Yid Boyar and uh, Murat Yaner, along with Chet and Romain. So let me just add them to stream. 
Hi. Ah, uh, hello. Nice Hi. to meet you. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? Yes. Yeah. So, please, please introduce yourself. <laughs> uh, my my name is Yit. I work in the Android team, mostly on the Jetpack libraries. Yeah. Cool. Uh, hey, Murat. Hey. How are you? Good. Good. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. So. Please give a quick introduction for our audience. <laughs> sure. Uh, I'm Murat. I'm a developer advocate in Android uh, Yeah. Cool. Uh, let me add Chet and Romain. Hey, everyone. Uh, hello again. Hello again. <laughs> so we have all the engineers here. So uh, now I'm going to go out and then I'm start presenting the questions which we had uh, from our audience. Cool. Permanent feature. Oh, shall I take that one? <laughs> well, that was an easy one. I think we answered this during the talk. Uh, no, it was it was basically pre-release in Android 10 because they had some finishing details. We talked about it on the podcast, actually. I asked them why. Um, but no, it is a full feature. The API is stable and solid, and we would like people to start using it. I don't know if there's a limit. I have no idea. Huh. <clears throat> this is a great example of a question that is a really good question to ask that we don't know the answer to. So I'm glad you asked this so that we could say that. I would say install the Android 11 beta, try it out, and let us know how many uh, how many cards can be presented. Write a for loop, <laughs> just like you can in some of the new NN API uh, implementations in Android 11. And uh, try it out. Yeah, I, I think you really need to write test steps to try it out because it takes a while for applications to integrate. Yep. Uh, custom format of media. Yeah, if it's not recognized as what image, video, or image, video, or audio. Um, I believe you have to use the storage access framework for that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You need to use the system document picker then. Yeah, it basically, it is a way to enable, it's a way to bring the user into the decision um, because you shouldn't be able to pick arbitrary files with your application without their knowledge, right? So we limit you to media files from the application, but you can bring the user in if, uh, if it's a file that's not recognized as that. Package manager. So uh, I would recommend you watch one of the talks from the um, launch videos. Uh, this is probably, I think it's in the, the privacy changes talk um, specifically where by default, uh, all applications have to declare the packages that they want access to. Um, there is a mechanism to declare that you need access to more, but then there's some process, I think a manual process that you have to go through um, to be posted on the store to make sure that we have to vet that applications are doing the right thing. You you can't just say, yep, I want access to everything and then it goes out there. Um, so if you're an application that does need valid access, um, there is a way to do that. I don't know the details, but watch the talk because I did see this in the last um, couple of weeks in one of the videos. Yeah, Murat? Yeah, Launcher apps can use the query all packages per minute. Uh, take a look at the Google Play guidelines on apps which can use uh, query all packages. But yes, Launcher apps is one of them. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this question, hey, Yeet, do you want to try to um, forestall the question that came up last week? Like, wait, you said it was alpha, and then you said it was recommended. Yeah, actually, all right. Yeah, I, I think this question is coming in the context of how we recommend the library that's in alpha, because you usually say don't use alpha libraries. Uh, now, it's not like when we say Hilt is the recommended, is immediately start using it today. Uh, that being said, the reason why we are so comfortable with Hilt 
compared to like many other alpha libraries is that uh, this is a collaboration with the Dagger team. And there used to be exist a very similar library inside Google that they use. So we didn't create Hill from scratch. We actually work with them to change that library to be more like public consumer instead of just inside Google. That's why we are very comfortable with the overall model of Hilt. We know it scales very well. Like we know it can cover many use cases. That's why we are okay to uh, recommend it right, right now. Uh, but the library is still alpha. That means we are going to make API changes. There will be iterations. But for us to be able to make those iterations, we need feedback. Uh, so please still use it. Uh, but you know, as, as an alpha library. Uh, not necessarily, you would delete some code or maybe out of code, but like, I wasn't necessarily like the amount of code doesn't necessarily mean that much. Uh, if you're happy with Dagger and if your setup works, no reason to change it. Uh, actually, so there is one part. Sorry, uh, when, while writing Guild, we also create integrations with the Jetpack library. So there's possible cases like with Work Manager and Dagger integration, you need to follow a bunch of steps to make both of them work together. And now with Guild, there's just one factory we give to you. You give it to the Work Manager, and it all works. So a bunch of integrations in your application would significantly become much simpler. Uh, so if you have time to do that, you may benefit a lot. But if your setup works, like there's really not much reason to change something that works. Like when does the system remove? Oh. The I uh, I don't know if there's specific timing on it, but like your your application is considered to be actively in use when it's in the foreground and for a short period of time after it goes into the background. It's not like immediately when the window goes down, the permission is removed, but it is a short time after that. So, I mean, it we're not talking hours here. Um, it's it's just considered to sort of be in transition when it when it goes away from the foreground. I think that's what they meant. Uh, if, so if you are using field, uh, we are working on making this super easy right now. Actually, I saw a manual from the field team. He just tweeted something. Uh, we can find an edit to the notes later on how you can scope your view models into a navigation graph while using help to inject them. And we, we are trying to figure out how to make this an API so you don't need to go through that, but it's a little bit more complicated because navigation graph scope view models don't really belong to uh, like a single fragment or an activity, so their owner is not very well defined. Uh, so until that comes, like check check out the tweet manual has implemented. If you are asking this question outside the scope of uh, field, I don't know. Like if, if you are using Dagger, we have this sample on the Git, GitHub architecture component sample. Like it will show you how to do multi binding to implement view model injection. You can do that. Besides that, I don't know with the others. DI frameworks. I I think they're just looking for extra credit. They're putting as many Jetpack buzzwords in as few words as possible. Like they got dependency injection and Hilt and view models and lifecycle by definition and navigation all at the same time in one short sentence. So I think they totally, they win the Jetpack contest if we had one. Is this like a tricky question? So I start talking about the super secret projects we have. <laughs> <laughs> They're all tricky questions. Yeah. In the open anyway, so you just have to watch your comments. <laughs> oh, maybe people should watch ASP, then they can also contribute to ASP. Yes. AOSP is like the most boring video live stream ever. Oh, I didn't know we had a live stream. <laughs> Uh, 
Marat, do you know this one? I know that there is a difference in uh, some of the behavior changes that we have in terms of like having to target new API versions. Yeah, actually, incremental location access uh, is already recommended in Android Q. Uh, it's not a big change, but in Android R, uh, we just made it required instead of uh, just being recommended. So if you previously uh, were following the best practices, uh, you sh should already be doing that in an incremental way. But if you haven't implemented yet, yeah, you need to first ask the foreground location, then uh, give users some time before ask asking the background location access. Do you know if this is one of the uh, behavior changes where it doesn't affect them if they don't target the release, or does this affect all applications? Uh, like I know most of them were relegated to target SDK, but I don't believe all of them, and I can't remember for a location. I don't remember. I know my favorite feature. Should we all name our favorite feature in Android 11? Do you have one? That is not the question in chat. Oh, but I want to interpret it as that. <laughs> Important change. Oh, that's hard. Well, <sighs> maybe uh, I would recommend everyone to watch the upcoming talk on privacy. Yeah. Um, I mean, it depends. It's it's really, uh, these things are comparing apples and oranges, right? Like the privacy changes are really huge. Like what the way that you treat your users and their data is hugely important and critical and growing in need every day, right? Um, some of the explorations that we do in UIs can seriously impact productivity and everybody's um, uh, happiness with their device and their usage patterns over time. So maybe the, some of the stuff in, in conversations will be hugely important, but you know it's early days on that. Um, hard to tell. Uh, IME animations are just cool. Um, I don't know. Anybody else? Yeah, I, like I, I don't know. I, I was watching one of the reviews on Android 11 the other day. I realized because internally we just use like a Droid food build, and I've been using that build. Like you see these features very slowly coming into your device every week. I was like, wow, I didn't know this was an Android only feature. I thought we always had it for a while. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think I get that. Uh, but I like the keyboard thing. That is keyboard thing is cool. So I, I saw a review where they were just going gaga over the control stuff, but I don't have like a, an automated house, so Sort of depends on where your life is at, how important these things are. Uh, I, mean, I, like in terms of I like bubbles. Now there's a standard way to turn off those. Uh, well, I mean, th 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 that, that is one of the reasons why we do have more privacy features in the OS, right? Because, uh, yeah, you can sideload applications, uh, and we're going to make sure that, you know, applications you, you load, no matter where they come from, uh, respect your privacy. So I'm not sure what kind of, of features we're talking about that are controlled by the Play Store itself. Um, I, mean, I, I think this is referring to the part where, <clears throat> you know, in Play Store, we block applications that are malicious or like right. they understand it, they're good applications. But if you use the installs a third party app store, then they can install any applications through that or they can sign those. Actually, I think this is one of the very nice things about Android, where if you're like a regular user, uh, you are safe, but you know if you know what you're doing and you want to side load an APK, Android doesn't prevent you from doing that. Uh, so I, I, I think it's fine because the user needs to make a judgment to like 
disable those securities and like pick another one, which might also be a good app store as well. It's not necessarily a like, malicious one. Uh, and that will be only a tiny percentage of users, and we hope that they know what they're doing. I don't know what is the new resource letter API. Do you know, Chad? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's something happening in the framework team that allowed um, resources to be loaded dynamically. Uh, I don't know the details, but I believe it's a platform change, which means cool. I really don't think this is something that can happen outside yeah. the platform. In general, because I'm, I'm seeing, I'm looking at some of the like live comments coming from YouTube. Um, it, it's um, in general, we backport what we can backport. Um, unfortunately, a lot of changes have to go in the OS, and the only kind of backport we can do is just an API you could call that would either be a no app on all the versions, or maybe like have some kind of fallback. Uh, but when you start touch, talking about resources, you know, media, graphics, yeah. stuff like that, it's, it's fairly unlikely that we can backport anything. Uh, the the second question that's certainly something that we can pass on to the team. I don't know what their plan is for samples. I I thought the appeal for this was fairly niche, like not necessarily applying to most developers. Um, uh, but if there's interest in in people using it more broadly, uh, we can see if there are plans around it. Yeah, and it's also a. Uh, I mean, there's a point here, right? Like we. <laughs> Our team, there's, there's a finite number of things we can do. Uh, and so we have to choose like, you know, what libraries we build. Every library we build is something we have to maintain and, you know, our APIs that we build. So uh, if there's a lot of demand, maybe we can look at it. Uh, and then I'm sure Yeet will scream at me for making him do more. No, I, I was just talking about the samples, just the last part of the question. Oh, yeah, that was, so, that was back not, to the, yeah. to, to the APIs. So. Anyway. Uh, so we certainly thought about this a couple of times. Uh, we actually we even did a UX research uh, a year ago to understand like how people are using it and like what is necessary. I don't know. I'm very postponed that enforcement one year uh, after. Uh, we kind of need to see more. Like at the time when we did that research, there wasn't really that much demand. Like there was. Uh, solutions already baked for people to do the right things, uh, because like one of the things about the storage is, like you need to be more specific about accessing the user's device from now on. Like so, it, it won't be like it was before, where you can read whatever you want uh, from the external storage. So you have to change your application. Uh, we we also consider like. Providing maybe a library that works more similar to App Compat, where like it, it mimics the behavior in the newer versions, but in the older versions, but that will be more like restricting you on the older versions to provide the new features. Uh, but anyway, so this is a topic we are looking at. Uh, if you have like very specific use cases, feel free to reach out to me or anybody from local relations. Uh, but so far, we don't have a plan right now. But who knows? I, I could suggest a really early, easy version of that library. I know you like easy libraries in your team you, where just whatever they ask for, you just return no. <laughs> it's just, it's the most restrictive version of storage access um, possible. It, so it's it it's very, it's very secure. What was that? Isn't that the, what the platform does already? <laughs> <laughs> there's a, there's an asymptote that it's approaching. It's not quite there yet, but the library could be there immediately. Uh, but yeah, just just to, uh, to 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 emphasize what it was saying, we we are aware of some of those pain points, and it's the kind of stuff that we 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 take into account. But you know, it's also difficult sometimes because there there are changes like this that will affect some apps more heavily than others. But we have to look at the entire ecosystem, um, and you know, we have to make a lot of difficult decisions. Uh, and so we've definitely been talking about storage, and I think we'll we'll, we'll keep thinking about it. I do not know. 
I think the general approach is just in, if you're using the best practice um, for permissions, you should already be able to handle this because they can deny you at any time, right? They can go into settings and they can take away the permissions that they may have granted earlier, which means your application already needs to deal with the situation. So I think whether it's being denied because they flipped a switch in the settings panel or whether be, we took it away when you went out of the foreground, like it, honestly, it's kind of academic, right? You just need to handle the situation because you cannot control what the user is going to do. I do not know. Yeah, these questions are very difficult here. Yes. Yeah. Oh, no. yeah, it's uh, along for the days where I knew the, all the APIs on the platform. Uh, this is just too much in, in now. Eat. It is coming. So we have been. I mean, we hope that this will be available by this I.O. Actually, if you were watching navigation and fragments, like we made so many major changes in the last couple of months. And they're in preparation to, you know, one of the goals is to allow backstack navigation. Uh, but it turns out over the span of whether eight, nine years, we dig ourselves a very, very deep hole in navigation and also in fragments. It takes a very really long time to dig out of it to make sure it, this architecture can support something like multiple bike stacks. Uh, I want to say we are close, but changing fragments is incredibly complicated because all the years people relied on the bugs in fragments. And now if you fix the bug, you break their application. So like every change, we have to be super careful uh, to make it stable. But anyways, TLDR, it is coming. I just cannot give a time frame. Uh, if you want AOSP, you can follow better. Uh, but we're going to support it in fragments. And then once we implement the fragments part, it's, it's actually very trivial on the navigation side. The problem is with uh, fixing fragments. Uh, we'll see. Well, it's not going to be an easy release, to be honest, because when we change fragments, I'll put things straight. That is not what App Startup is for. So uh, App Startup, and you'd correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I probably will be, uh, but the um, it's really about giving libraries of way to be notified that you know the application is starting, uh, so you can start initializing something. It's not like, it's not where you should create your splash screen or anything else. Uh, like a good example, for instance, uh, the, the library leak canary that detects memory leaks in your application, it needs to know the application is starting so it can start monitoring memory. So this this kind of library would use app startup to initialize itself. I think this is a repeat of the earlier question. Well, also uh, more importantly, for any kind of, um, oh, of no. automatic automatic decision we make in the system, uh, I assume we could find you the answer, or you can probably find it in the source code of AOSP, but it's the kind of stuff that we probably will tweak or might get tweaked. Um, so, yeah. Also, I was wrong. I was I was uh, mistaking this for one about the when applications went into the background. No, it's when a when an application has not been used for some long amount of time. And I'm sure that the code is written for some specific long amount of time right now. But as Laman said, this is just what we happen to be using right now. I wouldn't, you know, we, we don't really advertise those values because they could change over time, you know, based on what we learn. They did their homework. Uh, yeah. Oh my gosh, I, should, I, I know this question just came, so I couldn't check. Uh, this is this is the part about when the in-process scheduler, you just expanded the limits there. I have to follow up with you. 
sorry, I, I do not know what the, the exact change is, but the idea is like we used to limit you and now we can run more of your workers in parallel. It's actually, it's not necessarily better per se. Like you're doing more work in parallel, uh, but it usually helps with the throughput. Uh, I have to talk with the work major folks to see if does does this mean any like public API change? Well, I don't think it changes the public API. It just changes our defaults. I I think this question came up in the podcast that we did with Samir and Rahul um, a couple of months ago. I can't remember which episode, but uh, I don't know. Three or four months ago, we published an episode in Work Manager, and they talked about scheduling limits. I remember the question came up. I cannot remember the proper answer, but uh, you can go back and listen to that if you want to uh, hear it from the team. Uh, not that I know of, but also we never comment on future stuff. <laughs> Easy answer. That is uh, a big question. You go. <laughs> well, if the subtitle is not a file which the app contributed, then you need to go through a uh, system dialogue to uh, ask user to choose the file. Oh, someone got the uh, question. Their, 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 their question. Uh, how was it this going to play with Jetpack Compose? Um, I know that the team has been thinking about this quite a bit. Uh, I don't remember what the current status is, but yeah, that is something like safe state is something that you know we, we want to handle. But remember that Compose is a UI toolkit, right? So it doesn't invalidate. We are going to work on making sure it can play nice with navigation, let's say, or whatever else, you know, that it wants to do. Uh, but in itself, like, it doesn't change anything about the, the way the system works. Um, so yeah, it will still need a, a way for you to be able to save your state and restore your state. But the way it works in Compose, the state is not in the widgets. Like you pass the state to the widgets from the application. So it's really up to you. Um, there might be some trends in state that we might need to, 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 to save, like for instance, on rotation or stuff like that. Uh, but overall, it should be a lot easier than it was in the past. Um, and that's one of the main points of Jetpack Compose. Like there's only one source of truth for state. It's, you know, it's your model. It's not the model of the widgets and your model. Yeah. I should point out too that in the world of Jetpack Compose, it's not called process death; it's called decomposition. Uh, by the way, uh, that actually we already have the integration with the uh, safe state in Compose. Okay. Yeah, it's been already implemented, and under the hood, it does use the safe state and the load, like the same abstraction. Uh, but then, as Roman mentioned, Compose will just take care of it for you. I did go ahead and check that work manager thing. Uh, the API I mentioned is, has nothing to do with what I mentioned there. That's why I was confused. The max scheduler limit, uh, so let me repeat that work manager question. It was like, in the video I mentioned, uh, work manager now in, runs more workers in parallel, but that means like we can schedule more of them. Uh, that is about the in-process scheduler of work manager. The API mentioned in the question was like, there was no API change in the max scheduler limit. Uh, that's the limit uh, on work manager itself in terms of how many system jobs you can schedule. Uh, because the system gives a hundred jobs limit to each process by each application. So if you have some libraries that also schedules jobs and you're using work manager and work manager goes and uh, like schedules a hundred jobs, it's going to start canceling the jobs of the other code you have. Uh, using this max schedule limit API in configuration, you can tell work manager, hey, like don't don't use more than 50 jobs, manage it yourself. So you can reserve some of the jobs for your own application. Uh, that that is unrelated. 
Now I think the question is answered. All right, and I think that was the last question. Yeah, hi. <laughs> so yeah, we are gonna end this session now. So thank you all of us for joining. Uh, would you like to make an ending statement? Anything you want to add? Uh, no comment. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you for all the questions. Uh, we are going to start with our next session in around two minutes. So we'll see you then. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Uh, so let me just add Joe to the stream. Hey, Joe. Hey, good morning. Hi, how are you? <laughs> good morning to you, too. <laughs> so yeah, Joe is joining us from UK, where it is quite early. <laughs> I can see you're having your coffee. <laughs> so yeah, let me just add your screen. Um, yeah, Joe, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? And over to you. Oh, cool. perfect. Good stuff. Um, thanks for that. So yeah, um, nice to meet everyone. My name's Joe. I'm an Android engineer currently working at a company called Buffer. Um, based in the UK. So yeah, nice and early for me this morning. But I'm um, happy to be here and I'm going to be talking about Android 11 and how we can adapt our applications to some of the changes that are coming. Um, so yeah, kind of uh, going off of the talk that um, the sessions that we just watched and hopefully there's some insights that this session will give you. So before we get started, just wanted to mention um, about any questions. Um, if you've got any questions that come up throughout the session, do put them into the chat and the organizers will have them ready for the end of end of my session so I can answer them. Um, this just helps with the flow of things. Uh, and likewise, uh, if you want to reach out on Twitter or anything, um, my Twitter handle is on the first slide at, at hi there, Joe. So feel free to reach out if there's any extended questions that you might not want to ask here. So with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So privacy changes. Um, privacy, as we know, um, as Android engineers, there is, this is an area that's constantly changing in Android. It's evolving. And you know that it's for the best. It's for, for, the, for what our users want. People are more concerned about privacy. And I'm sure as users of Android ourselves, um, we also have the same thoughts in mind. Um, I remember the first time that we had like bigger changes. We saw scoped permissions introduced in Android 6 which required a lot of changes, um, having to request permissions uh, when they're required, and then having to be sure to check those, like as if, they're, if those permissions are changed and, and so on. And that was quite a big change for the development workflow for features. Um, and then we saw privacy improvements gradually put in place, place as we went through Android 7 to Android 8 to Android 9. And in Android 10, we saw the introduction of scope storage 
as well as restrictions on background location access. So things have always been changing. But the changes that were made in Android 11 kind of paved the path to evolve into an even greater Android platform in terms of user privacy. And when it comes to Android 11, we see even further changes here to improve the privacy that we have in our applications, as well as the data that our applications can access. So in this talk, we're going to cover all these enhancements that come with Android 11. So some of these are changes that we are required to make, and some of them kind of enhancements that are offered to help us understand more about the data that we are accessing. So first one um, seems very fitting as we were just talking about uh, permission changes. Um, so the first change here is what's known as one-time permissions. Um, so when given a choice, uh, users are choosing to share less and less private data with the applications that they're using. Um, Google also saw that there were many apps which were requesting background location access when they didn't actually have any need for it. Um, I'm sure we've all opened applications and been bombarded with permission requests as soon as the app was launched. And you're like, what's going on? Why, why do the apps need this? Um, and it's quite has been quite a habit for applications to group permission requests because it deemed to be easier. Um, so based on the feedback from users and developers, um, Android is going to be giving more users even more granular control over the privacy of data. So this includes location access, camera access, and microphone access, as well as significantly limiting access to background location. Um, so let's take a look at a couple of examples. So users will be able to grant temporary one-time permissions for location permission requests, and also for microphone access. So let's suppose this is an application such as a conferencing app that is rarely used. You know, we go to, well, at the moment, we don't really go to conferences in person, but when we go back to going to conferences in person, um, you usually have an application, you have the schedules, and you know, you use that application maybe once a year, twice a year. Um, so you're rarely using it. And granting permission for those applications that you rarely use seems like a, a heavy burden. Um, so in these applications, users can make, say, voice-only calls and so on. Um, with these one-time permissions, users have the option to not permanently commit to that permission, such as to record audio permission. Um, you know, you know when you're granting that permission or using it, that permission is only used at that time. And as soon as you leave uh, that application, that permission is revoked. And the same applies to camera access. If the same app also supports, say, video calls, the app would request the record video permission, and the same would happen when the app would be left to. So you may have this important question in mind. What does this mean for me as a developer? What do I need to do to support this? And the good news is that if you're currently following the permission best practices, you don't need to do anything. Um, you know, if we're, as mentioned in the last session, if we're following best practices of requesting permissions um, when they are required and checking the permissions are available when we're trying to access them, we shouldn't need to make any changes in our applications here. Um, so let's take Look at a little example in terms of uh, some pseudocode. So say we want to um, access a location feature in our application. Um, what happens here on the left-hand side is, is what happens if we follow the permission best practice. Um, so first, we check if the permission is granted. Um, and when this is first run, for example, the permission isn't available. So next, we will let the system decide if uh, we should show some form of in-app UI to give an explanation of why we need that permission. So um, normally not always the first time the system will consider that that is, is needed. And finally, we get to the point where we need the permission. So um, say this is the first time we're requesting it. So in this case, we request the location permission and this lets, this prompts, um, the system will prompt the user with the three options. Um, and this will be whether the user wants to grant it all the time or grant it this single time or deny it. So let's say the user presses the deny button. Um, in this case, the on request permission result callback will be invoked and the permission will be rejected. Um, so when this happens, again, we should make sure that we explain the functionality will not work um, without that permission. Um, maybe you want to use a snack bar or some other form of in-app um, instruction. And, and that's pretty, most applications are doing this at the moment. Um, if the permission is requested, then you know you can carry on using it. Um, but the important the important thing here is that best practice um, 
might it may be your, your application is already following this, but being aware that the user, as mentioned again in the previous session, I think Chet said, your user can revoke these permissions at any time. Um, and having that one-time access, I think, um, uh, strengthens on that statement even more. Like that can that cannot be available the next time the user launches the app. So we need to make sure that we're checking the permissions and handling them correctly. Um, so if the user grants that um, one-time permission in in that pseudocode, so in terms of some examples of when this data will be available, um, so with that permission granted that single time, um, while the app's activity is visible that the permission was granted in, your application can access the data. If the user brings your app to the background, um, your app can continue to access the data for a short period of time. Um, I don't think there's a defined amount of time, um, but it's let's call it a short period of time. If you launch a foreground service while the activity is visible um, and the user moves to the background, then your app continue, can continue to access the data until that service is stopped. And finally, if the user revokes that one-time permission, which can be done anytime in the system settings, then kind of your access to that data is killed. Um, regardless of whether you launch a foreground service or so on, um, that is uh, not available anymore. Um, so one, once that permission is revoked, that one-time permission, the next time the user goes into your application and that permission is required, we go through exactly the same process again. Um, that permission will need to be requested and that same life cycle will happen. And yeah, so I mentioned, if you're already following the best practices for permissions that were introduced in Android 6, like sc um, the scoped permissions, you should be fine here, but it's always good to test it and make sure you test these changes just to be sure um, you provide a good experience and, and maybe there's a chance for you to improve things otherwise. Um, when it comes to location permission, <laughs> the location permission is a special permission. Um, and the aim here, so in Android 10, we wanted to give users fine grain control over location permissions because location permission is an you know, it's a big privacy concern. Like people don't want to want to be exactly like known known where they are and, and sort of monitored. So in Android 10, these permissions were splitted into a foreground um, location access as well as a background location access. So apps are encouraged to incrementally request these permissions to give users better control. So you ask for the foreground permission first, followed by all-time location access. Um, so this was, in Android 10, this was uh, recommended to be followed. But now in Android 11, this is a requirement. So once you target Android 11, you will need to request the foreground permission first, followed by the background permission. When it comes to Android 11, um, there's no change to the way you request the foreground um, permission. So we're currently uh, on the screen, you can see uh, a way for requesting this permission. Um, this is how we're probably, we'll currently be doing it in our applications. Um, that's fine, that will still work in Android 11. There is no change required here. Um, however, for background access, there are a couple of changes when it comes to Android R. Um, so to begin with, the first point, um, it's good practice, to, as we mentioned, to incrementally request permissions as it gives users a chance to understand and decide based on the context. Like foreground permission, you know, is only accessible when the app's open. Um, that feels less of a commitment. The background access is a big thing. So asking for both of those together is a big commitment. Um, you should only ask for background location after your app has been given foreground access. So as I mentioned, this is recommended on Android 10, um, but is now a requirement on Android 11. Um, when your app requests background location permission, um, this is where the change comes in. Um, the request permissions API will send the user directly to the settings screen. So instead of the regular permission request dialogues. Um, so before this happens, it's good practice to educate the user before requesting that extra permission with some sort of UI, because as soon as they um, you show, as soon as you send the user to system settings, kind of they're outside of your app essentially. So there will not be an opportunity there to explain why that's needed. So before that happens, it's good to show UI to explain that just like we would for other permissions. And secondly, make sure to provide the option for the user to refuse. Um, don't just send the user to the system settings without offering the opportunity to refuse it. Um, this is because there are rate limits um, around um, like sending the user to the uh, system settings screen. Um, 
has a similar result uh, or behavior to denying a permission. So if you send the user to that screen, uh, it does count to your rate limit. So don't just default to that and make sure you still explain and offer the chance to the user to deny it. Um, so this is obviously a little bit of a change um, to how we're used to dealing with things. Um, however, this does make it easier for us developers. There's no new API for this system permission. Um, we just, you know, the dialogue will send the user to that and handle it for us. Um, so that's great for us, although it's a change, it's great for us. Um, and apps get to control the UI for most of the process. So as mentioned, we have the chance to display to the user um, why they're being sent there and what that permission is needed for, um, but that is now handled by the system. So just to iterate back on that point of the rate limit, um, it would be worth reading up on the documentation to, 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 to see how your app might behave there, but that will behave the same way as if the permission was denied. Cool. Um, so to ensure there is still compatibility for apps targeting Android 10, um, whilst this is a big change for Android 11 and sending the system and we're having those two uh, location permissions split um, for Android 10, um, it is still allowed to request both foreground and background permissions at the same time if you really need them. Um, it's still recommended to do them separately, but if you do show them at the same time, then an extended dialogue will be used that can, that handles both cases. And that dialogue will still um, give the functionality of sending the user to that system setting screen to, to manage that setting. Um, so that is there if you need it. Um, but still, if your application is using that way, maybe think about um, following best practices if it feels uh, right for your application. So one thing that is new in Android R, so um, if your app hasn't been used by the user for several months, I'm sure we've all got applications on our phones which we've either forgot about or just haven't used for a while. And um, one cool thing which I'm actually quite looking forward to is the system will reset your application submission automatically um, if the application hasn't been used for several months. Um, so this will be as if the user has reset the app submissions within your application settings. Um, the user can turn this setting off on their device, but um, yeah, this was this is essentially um, goes strengthens what was being said earlier again. That not only now can the user reset your permissions at any time or revoke your permissions, the system will also revoke your permissions after a few months of not being used. So, if you're following best practices, um, you don't need to make any changes. You're checking permissions before accessing sensitive data, requesting them if you don't already have them, and handling them gracefully. Um, if you're doing that, you're fine because if they're revoked, you'll just request them when they're needed again, which is good practice. If you're not doing that currently, um, it'd be worth, you know, testing this on Android 11, Android R, um, resetting permissions and seeing how your application behaves and, and catching any cases or edge cases where this happens. So this only affects apps that target in the API level of Android 11, um, so this won't affect other applications. So most apps will not need this, um, but there are certain cases where the user expects an application to primarily work in the background. Um, so the app can consider redirecting the user to the app detail settings screen to toggle auto reset for the app. So this is an intent that which can be launched and you can, you can take that user directly to the screen to not reset those permissions. Um, not advise using this unless you really need it because if you're having to if you're sending the user to to that screen to to toggle that um like like it said like i said in most cases this will not be needed um if your if your application needs to work in the background most of the time and the user doesn't really open it that might make sense but personally follow the best practice and the user being able to reset the permissions or the system should not be a concern for you um so yeah um that's that's uh, that's the permissions. Um, that's all the permission changes that are coming in Android 11. Um, there are some changes there, but most of them, if we're following best practices, um, we shouldn't be too affected by them. If there's any questions on that, feel free to to feel free to ask them in the chat, and I'll do my best to answer them at the end of the session. So next, data access auditing. Um, so this is more of a developer uh, feature, I guess as you could call it, um, and it's actually quite interesting. So this is an, a new API to su uh, support to discover potentially unintended access to private data. 
um, for the application that you're developing. So when it comes to building mobile apps, um, one of the best practices is to ensure transparency when accessing private data. So for example, it should be clear and obvious why uh, a video calling app um, needs access to a user's contact information um, or, or, or any app it needs uh, specific access to a certain type of data. Uh, when it comes to identifying data access within a project, um, so it can be difficult to identify this. Um, whilst we're, you know, we're developing features and, and we know most of the time, or we check what um, data our features are accessing, um, it can be hard to know this in some cases. So, so for example, um, large apps often have um, orphaned code and have large teams. Accidental data access can happen in these cases. You know, if we're working with code we might not have used before, or don't know that's there, and you could still be accessing data um, without us being aware of it. Um, any apps may use closed source third party SDKs. These SDKs may access private data without us knowing, and um, they could be like piggybacking off of the already the permissions that our users have granted with an application and accessing data. Um, and in these cases, like this isn't about pointing the blame and saying developers are accessing data they shouldn't. This is this, is, this can be unintended. Um, it's these things, as I mentioned, aren't always easy to identify. So this isn't about pointing the blame. This is just about how we're trying to, to be more aware of what we're accessing on behalf of our users. Um, my slide's gone. Cool. So um, therefore, so in Android 11, we have two new APIs to bring, to give uh, control to developers over the data usage in applications. So first feature is, is essentially a callback that we can use to retrieve uh, data, um, to retrieve uh, a notice when data is accessed. And then on top of that, we also have um, a functionality to allow developers to attribute access to logical features within an application. So let's break these down a little bit. So in this picture here, we have each blue line represents a piece of code in the app. And the gray lines symbolize that this code is um, accesses certain private data. So we have many different bits of code accessing, accessing location, many different bits accessing contacts and so on. Um, whenever the app calls an API that returns private data, um, with this API, the system calls into a collection handler immediately before returning to the calling code. So hence at this time, the collection handler can collect a stack trace to record which code performs the access, um, which means developers can be aware of the functionality that's being used. So let's look at the API. So this shows how to set up a callback for data access through the AppOps Manager class. So if you want to consistently track it for the entire app, you can set this up within the application on create function. Say you want to localize it to a particular part of your app, you could do that within the on create function of the activity. So within the on op noted callback class, your app will be notified of data access in synchronous calls. So when this happens, you may log the stack trace to help you identify the source of this access during development. And for asynchronous access, for example, when your app registers a callback listener. Um, so I'd recommend checking out the API reference for more details on this. Um, but whether you using that callback, maybe you could uh, log these things locally during development. You could also, if you're using some form of tracking system um, for analytics, you could also track them through there and keep a track of what data is being accessed um, in a more uh, sufficient monitoring approach. So more complex apps often contain multiple distinct features. So maybe we have a, a mapping app that might have navigation, might be able to explore shopping, uh, maybe find friends feature and so on. And these are quite different features that require different kinds of permissions. Um, in Android 11 for this, um, you now allow for an app to attribute a subset of the app as belonging to one feature. Um, so each of the features uses a subset of private data. So e.g. Uh, the find friends feature might not need to use the microphone. It just needs access to contact and the location. Having features as a high level concept compared to just areas of code makes it easier to find what features have accidental data access. And um, so further, this will make it easier to explain to the user what private data is used for. So this can help us, for example, maybe our find friends code would be accessing the microphone data. And at this point, we'd be like, why is it doing that? I didn't even know that was doing it. Um, so we can remove that access, tidy our code up and using this API and um, help to you know, bring more um, transparency to the data that is being accessed. 
So the data auditing API allows you to attribute data access to specific features as shown on this screen. So let's have a quick look at how this can be done using this API. So to attribute these features in your code, you can create an attribution context and give it a meaningful name that corresponds to your feature. So for example, uh, in the case of the find friends feature, um, you can see here, you can, um, yeah, so you use the create attribution contact function. Um, you can then pass this context to API calls. And within the data auditing callback, you can recover the attribute through this variable attribution tag. So for example, you can then track the attribute with your analytic solution and associate a particular feature with private data access. So yeah, once we set this attribution context um, by creating it, we can then access the attribution tag um, when it comes to the callback from our onops note callback. Um, so this is just a, a, you know, doesn't seem like much, but it's just, uh, for developers, it's a simple API to allow us to break down features and logically track the data that is accessed by them. Um, not all applications might not have use for this, but I think it's an interesting, um, an interesting thing that can help us, you know, make more sense for applications, especially with working with larger apps and code that we're not too familiar with, um, to really help us improve the privacy side of things. Cool. So moving on to service types. So there's some new foreground service types coming in Android 11. So to provide better accountability for apps to access private data in the foreground service, there are a couple of new foreground service types. Um, these are the microphone and the camera. So Android introduced the concept of foreground service types in Android 10. Um, so apps can declare their intentions to access this info within its foreground service. So only at this time, only two types were enforced. So there was media projection. This was stuff such as Android Auto, Bluetooth, TV, um, other devices using connection um, in that way. Um, that also had location. So this was things such as GPS, maps, navigation, location updates. Um, but now there are going to be a couple of other defined types. Um, and this will be um, for the camera and the um, microphone. So there's a couple, yeah, as mentioned. So there's a couple of additional foreground service types in Android 11. Um, camera is one of them. So going back to Android 9, um, apps could no longer access the camera in the background. So for quite some time, this could only be done in the foreground anyway. So in terms of development, development this isn't too much of a change for us. Um, if your app targets Android 11, it essentially needs to declare the new types. So if you're using the camera um, in the foreground, you essentially need to declare it. Otherwise, the foreground service will not receive the data from the camera. Um, so here we see what we need to add to our manifest. And this is the manifest entry for the camera foreground service. Um, if you need to access different data from different foreground services, such as the microphone, which we previously mentioned, then you can declare them together. So you don't need to add a service entry for each single one. You can essentially declare them um, using the OR operator. Cool. So that's quite a, a short section. But just to recap, if you need to use a foreground service to access any of this data. So location was already something that was in place in Android 10. Camera and microphone are new foreground service types. If you need these in the foreground service, you must declare them in your manifest. Otherwise, they won't work. Um, so yeah, it's a small change, but a really important thing to be aware of. So next topic is package visibility. I know there are a couple of questions that came up on this in the last session. So maybe this will help to um, add some clarity to those. Uh, again, if you've got any questions, drop them in the chat. So in Android 10 and older, um, um, this API and others allowed an app to see which other apps are just are installed on the device. So when I when I first saw this change, I I was like, I, I, well, I just saw the function call and I was like, oh, that's not that bad. And then I read the description and just reading that was like, allow an app to see which other apps are installed on the device. In my head, I was like, oh, wow, that's actually quite a big privacy concern. Um, you know, just seeing the function, you don't really think of that, but seeing it broken down, does actually open your eyes a bit and think, yeah, I can see why maybe this is changing and it, it seems it makes sense. Um, so to provide better accountability for access to installed apps on a device, so Android 11 inc includes some changes to how apps can both query and interact with other apps. So for several common scenarios where you may access 
the installed uh, packages on the device, you do not need to make any changes. Um, for example, um, querying the package manner, manager for other applications. This is a common um, use case, should not need any changes. Um, so if you target Android 11, um, get package info, followed by get package name, which is for your own app. Um, this will return the package information for your own application because you're requesting it for your application. That's allowed. That will work as expected. No changes required there. Um, I don't think that um, might be a surprise, um, but that is fine. If you're doing that, no concerns. Um, however, if you include get installed packages, um, again, unaffected, this will return the calling app certain system packages, such as a media provider and anything that influenced the core Android functionality. Um, if you send an implicit intent for another app to take action, maybe you're using an image capture intent, a photo picker intent or so on, um, whatever implicit intent you're accessing, this um, will work as intended because implicit intents are allowed and they're fully supported still in Android 11. So that's also an unaffected operation. Um, if there's more than one app that can handle that intent, then you'll be the system will show a dialogue for the user to choose the app from. Again, another unaffected one. Um, if you um, another app calls your app's content provider and expects results, then that will still work as intended because a content provider is there to provide content for external apps. Um, so that's going to work as intended. Um, that's fine. So as we can see, there's already a collection of unaffected interactions, um, which most apps are probably using. So um, if you're using those, there's no concern for those operations. So, um, however, the changes that will uh, affect are retrieving the package info for another application. So if you try to get the package info for another app, a name not found exception will be found, will be thrown. So even if this com.another app application is installed on the device, calling this get package info will, will return a name not found exception. So that it can be handled and uh, let's take a quick look at how we can do that. So if you need to explicitly interact with another app, so for example, your application may need to invoke a specific activity in another application, or it may need to bind to a service. We can use a new queries element in the manifest to explicitly specify the packages your app needs to query or interact with. So if we add this package declaration to our manifest um, under the queries tag, our application can now query for the those package names. Um, we can add multiple package names um, to provide support for that without an issue. Or you can do this implicitly through an intent filter signature. So the app uh, can now query for all types that handle an action send intent for JPEG images, e.g. to populate the custom share sheet. And um, these apps will now show up in get installed packages results. Um, so as mentioned, um, this call will not work unless you add the queries tags um, to your manifest. So that is the main, that is the essentially the change that this is introduced in Android 11. Your other operations will still work. If you're accessing operations like this, um, you need to add uh, the, the correct declarations to your manifest. Um, the best way to test this, to be honest, is set your app's target SDK version to 30. Um, don't add the queries tags. Um, I think it's important not to just start adding queries tags because you think you need them. Um, don't add the tags um, and test your application, um, may maybe where you're calling these functions and essentially see what features of your application are not working. Um, if a feature is not working, if the interaction with the other applications is not functioning correctly, then you'll need to add the queries tags. Um, yeah, so just to iterate on that. Don't just start adding tags because you feel they are needed. Um, let's test it and then go back and add them to, to fix functionality. Um, so in practice, we found that most apps can easily express necessary package interactions with intent and package declarations. Um, however, um, there are some cases that um, Google did identify, identify where query or packages permission was needed. Um, Again, don't just add this. <laughs> um, this isn't something that most applications should need, to be honest. Um, I know it's like 
reminds me of the request legacy storage. <laughs> um, it's easy to add, um, but we don't. If you don't need it, don't add it. Um, again, Google did. Google have specified that will be use cases for this. If you are an application that might need this, um, please do give uh, pass on feedback to Google as to why it's required or any any feedback that there is. But um, yeah, it is available if it's required. Um, so sometimes um, if a social, maybe a map app or social app, fires a view intent for a certain URL, uh, you want to be able to take users directly to your native app that can handle the URL, um, also known as deep links. So if you did this, um, your user will get a, a disambiguation dialog box um, making the UI kind of janky. Um, so on Android 11, there's a couple of new intent flags. So one of which is a flag activity require non-browser flag. Um, but so this ensures that the intent is only handled by a native app. Um, so if one, if a native app isn't available, then an activity not found exception will be thrown. Um, in the exception handler, you can choose to take over the handling intent, e.g. display the URL in a Chrome tab, maybe a web view within an application. So there's another similar intent flag called a flag activity require default. Um, it ensures that there must be one default app that can handle the view intent. Else it also results in the same exception, so you can override the experience for a user. Um, so to discover more details about how these changes to package of visibility will affect your app, you can enable log messages for package filtering. Um, Maybe you're developing a test app or debuggable app in Android Studio, and this capability is already handled for you, enabled for you. So otherwise, you can run the following command in your terminal window and enable it manually. And um, so then, when when you run this and when this is running, whenever packages are filtered out of a package manager, objects return variables. You see a message similar to um, um, the 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 log shown on screen. Um, so just to be aware, the this will affect your application performance. Um, so make sure you, it's pretty good practice to disable this unless you're specifically testing for package visibility behavior, just to avoid any issues with performance um, during testing and debugging. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of it in terms of package vis visibility and a new way to handle deep links. And there's also the restrictions now on accessing installed apps. Um, most changes, uh, most cases here will be unaffected. Um, but the best thing to do, as mentioned, is set your target SDK to uh, Android R, which is API level 30, and test that uh, packages are still available uh, where needed. Um, cool. Scope storage, um, probably the one a lot of us, <laughs> a lot of people have been waiting to, to hear more about. Um, I know this is uh, an interesting one on Android 10, which, um, as mentioned in the previous sessions, with uh, some pain points for media access. So um, it's good to have some more uh, context here. So. Let's look at scope storage. So before the introduction of scope storage in Android 10, there were two classifications of external storage. So we had application storage and we also had shared storage. So any apps with storage permission had access to all the shared storage. Um, Android 10 scope storage changed this by adding a distinction between media files as well as other documents. So rather than apps gaining access to all files instead in shared storage, um, they not only have access to media files. So in order to gain access to documents which could potentially contain more sensitive data, um, the app needs to ask the user to grant access specifically to these documents. So on screen, we can see the specific scope storage changes that came in Android 10. So unrestricted media and downloads contributions, um, only media collections can be read with a storage permission, location meta metadata, um, required permission to be accessed. Um, the system picker was used for other file types and the reading or writing outside of collection requires a system picker. So this was enforced by the SDK, but we did have the opportunity to opt out of this um, as it, some, for some applications there was a big change. So there was a lot of feedback received from developers um, around this scope storage um, because you know people needed time to migrate and that's why the temporary opt-out was available via the request legacy external storage attribute. Um, after you update your app to target Android 11, um, the system will ignore this. So um, if your app opts out of scope storage when running on Android 10 devices, 
you can continue to set this um, and your application will behave as expected on Android 10. But Android 11, this, the system will now ignore this flag. Um, so Android 11 improves upon scope storage in a number of ways um, than when we've come from Android 10. So there's been a couple of changes that have been made to storage permissions. So these changes take effect in Android 11, regardless of your app's target SDK version. So to begin with, the storage runtime permission is now renamed to files and media. And with your, when you're targeting Android version R, which is uh, API level 30, um, if, your, if your app hasn't opted out of scope storage and requests the read external permission, users will see a different dialog when compared to Android 10. So this dialog indicates that the app is requesting access to photos and media. Um, users can still see which apps have the read external storage permission in system settings by going to their privacy permissions manager. And each app that has the permission is listed under allowed for all files. So if your app targets Android 11, the the right external storage permission and the right the right media storage privilege permission no longer provide any additional access. Um, it's important to keep in mind that devices running Android 10 or higher, you can still contribute to well-defined media collections such as downloads without requesting any storage rate late permissions. Um, but these two permissions no longer provide any additional access on top of what is already granted. So in Android 10, um, user consent was required to edit or delete media that was not contributed by your app. So to do this, you must use the media store API to trigger a dialogue to request user consent. Um, if the user accepts, you'll get a call back into your app and can proceed to access the file either within the media store APIs or by using the file path. So in Android 11, we are improving the user consent flow for editing or deleting media. So you can now batch multiple edit or delete requests in one dialogue rather than pop one dialogue per request, which could probably get quite annoying for the user. Uh, this will significantly improve the user experience and applications and was actually quite a, a sort of a request in Android 10. So um, I think Google quite looking forward to people having access to this. Um, you always, as developers in our code, we always have the option to copy the file to our apps directory on external storage and edit the copy. But this would only be recommended for one-off edits and for small size files, um, since obviously we don't want to clutter the user's disk space. And, and if this is done, um, be sure to provide an option uh, within settings or so on to clear that up when requested. So let's take a quick look at how one of these batch operations might work. So after calling the create write request, for example, the system builds a pending intent object. And after your app invokes this intent, users will see a dialogue that requests their consent for your app to update or delete the, specific, the specified media files. So on the result, we want to evaluate the user's response and either proceed, or if the user did not consent, explain to the user why your app needs the permission. And this makes it nice and clear as to why that's required. Um, this operations will work the same whether we're doing the, the write request, the delete request, or the edit request, or so on. Um, but once that's allowed, we have access to those media files and we can handle them within our application. So also with Android 11 are coming some file access restrictions. Um, so there's a lot of information this, on this in the developer documentation, um, but depending on how we're accessing files, there might be some changes that are required. So with the open document tree action, um, when accessing documents on um, the device, your user can no longer access the following folders uh, and files from the documents UI. So this is the root of internal storage on the volume or uh, SD card volume, the downloads directory, the Android data directory and all of its subdirectories and the Android OBB directory and all of its subsequent subdirectories. Um, so that's quite, a, could be quite a change for some applications. Um, there's also some changes similar to the open document action. Um, that can no longer be used to request that the user select individual files from, again, some directories being the Android data directory, a Android data directory, as well as the Android OBB directory. Um, so a subtle difference is there, open document tree can't access the downloads folder or the root as well as the corresponding subdirectories, whereas open document um, just can't access the subdirectories of the Android one, specifically being data and OBB directories. Um, again, 
if your application might be affected by that, um, please check out the privacy, doc the privacy change documentation on the Android preview developer site. So direct file path access for media. So the general guidance for accessing media files is through the media store because that lets the system better manage file access and is also more performant. Um, and it's kind of like the safest way for us to access files uh, for our application. So in Android 10, I guess to kind of enforce that and trying to encourage more people to do that, direct file path access was locked down. Um, however, developers gave a lot of feedback that that wasn't always possible. And um, and because this can be quite important for like third party libraries, um, such as FFmpeg, and that's one that needs it, and probably many others. So in response, that is being re-enabled in Android 11. So direct file path access for media provides a native file-like interface to media store to allow apps and libraries to continue using file APIs to access media content. If this is something your app needs, the recommended approach is to opt out of scope storage with a manifest flag on Android 10. Um, that will mean that you can support the same approach to media access on both Android 10 and Android 11. So with direct file path access on Android 11, opting out of scope storage on Android 10 will mean you can still access media using direct file paths. Um, however, um, only use that if it is needed. Um, if you're if you're like an application that doesn't need that specific access, um, if you can access files through the media store, that should be the way that you are accessing files. Um, I would still highly recommend um, not opting out of scope storage if you can remove that and supporting access from the media store, because um, that is the suggested way to do it. And there are um, many reasons in terms of performance and developer experience to do so. So yeah, performance impacts of direct path access. So keep in mind that the API does support noted file access and it is built on top of the media store. Um, and it's primarily intended for apps and libraries that rely heavily on those APIs. So because it's built on top of the media store, there can be some performance penalties for using it. So if performance is your number one priority, use the media store APIs. Um, and if you don't need direct file pass access, use the media store APIs. Um, based on some tests that have been carried out, it, these operations are most expensive for opens and also first reads. And obviously the more your app uses it, the bigger the impact that will be seen. So just to iterate again, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, default to the media store and only use the file path access if you really, really require it. Um, cool, the last change for <laughs> scope storage. And so as on Android, we want to continue allowing some apps to have broad access to files and on external storage and provided they have a use case that really requires it. Um, in Android 11, apps can declare the manage external storage permission, which will allow them to access the user to grant all files access in settings. Um, sounds kind of dangerous, but there are a couple of app examples that will be allowed. So file managers, I think there was a lot of feedback and concern over file managers for file access. Um, so apps whose main purpose is to let them manage user files will be allowed to access this setting. Um, applications that primarily offer backup and restore, so requiring bulk access to files, such as switching devices or backing up in the cloud. Um, however, if your app requires access to a single file, such as a word processor app, you should instead use the storage access framework. Um, would re highly recommend looking at um, Google Play and the guidelines for this permission and when it should be used and how it should be used. Um, if you do fall into an application that needs this if, under your development, um, do reach out to Google and give feedback on it because um, this is obviously quite a big permission and it's really important to, to have the correct feedback there from the, from the right people. Cool, so that's scope storage. And to finish up, just a couple of other important changes that are coming with Android 11 around privacy. So before Android 11, the read phone state permission covered a broad set of information. And this is a, a good, this is a really good example of um, giving more granular control over the permissions for a specific feature. So the read phone state permission would give general states such as is the phone ringing or is the phone idle, but it would also give private information such as phone numbers. 
And this is one of those things, again, where when you read that permission name, you're like, oh, read phone state. Yeah, that doesn't sound too bad. Like, just what's the state of the phone? But when you dig into it, you start to realize, like, reading reading that back and um, what I just said, um, it's kind of like, oh, wow. So that's actually accessing a lot of private data. And and that kind of opens opened my eyes a bit more about, okay, these changes are, are really needed. Um, so as we can see, we have the generic information for call states, and we also have a lot of private information in the terms of phone numbers. Um, if your app tag targets Android R, um, the permissions become more fine-grained. So read phone numbers permission covers um, the tele telephony manager API and the telecom manager API. And whereas, but yeah, so read phone numbers is those two APIs. Um, and that means that essentially now when you want the phone state, you use the first permission. And when you want the phone numbers, you use second permission. Um, if your app is using read phone state and you're targeting Android R, um, be aware that you will need to split those permission requests up if you need both of them um, as required. So if your app only needs phone numbers, you may just want to declare your permissions like this um, and request the only ones that you need. Again, they need to be added in your manifest, but um, just request the ones at runtime as they are required. Um, so a couple of other small changes. Um, Mac address restrictions. I'm not going to read everything what is on the screen there. Um, but essentially, the general guideline here is to not work with MAC addresses. <laughs> um, why? Uh, so MAC addresses are globally unique. Um, they're not user accessible, and they and they survive factory resets. So it's generally not recommended to use MAC addresses for any form of user identification. Um, devices running Android 10, for example, um, uses uh, randomized MAC addresses to all apps that aren't device owner apps. So. And Android 11 um, sees these following changes. So you can no longer access MAC addresses for network interfaces and so on. So if you want to know any more information, read up on the, um, the, 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 the developer preview site for changes here. But yeah, the general guideline is to avoid using these uh, where possible. Um, so preloaded apps are still granted the um, permission by default for system alert windows. So um, the this intent no longer supports a package name being supplied in the data UI. So um, I've never used actually used this intent, but um, I know that when you previously launched it, you passed it a URI, and it would be taken to the overlay management screen for your application. So that is no longer the case. You can no longer pass that URI for the package. Um, when you launch that intent, the user will be taken to the screen that displays all apps, and the user will need to select the specific app on the screen. I think this makes sense because um, if you could pass a package name, you, you could, you know, you could be, uh, provide any misinformation and, and users might just grant permission where required. And obviously this is quite a big permission. So um, giving the user control to select the application, even if it means it's a little bit more work for the user to select it, it's a lot safer and a lot more secure. Um, so essentially the action here is launch the intent and the user will be shown a screen to select which apps can draw on top of other apps. Um, so yeah, a bit of a change, but um, for users, it should provide more privacy. Cool. So that's it. <laughs> that's the the kind of overview of privacy changes. Um, again, there's, if you look into the developer preview um, write-ups in the, the, on Android, on the developer preview site, there are probably a few more smaller changes. Um, th these were the bigger things that to be more aware of, um, but I would really advise you looking into the, the developer preview documentation and seeing what's there and having a look and really understanding these changes and, and seeing what your application needs to adhere to. Um, yeah, so there's big changes in locate like location access, um, permission access, scope storage are the biggest ones for me. Um, but if you're following best practice in a lot in a lot of cases, these shouldn't be too much of a change for applications. Um, again, just want to iterate on the testing, upgrade to Android. 11, um, change your target SDK and test your app, see what works, see what doesn't work, and then make changes based off that. And um, I think it's good practice to avoid just changing things for the sake of it and, and seeing what we really need our application to do and what we need to adhere to. Um, cool. So I hope that was useful um, and hope to kind of open your eyes, maybe giving you a bit of peace of mind now and not, not, not made you worried about any upcoming changes. Um, if anyone's got any questions, like I've got some time now. If there are any asked, I'm happy to answer some. 
And likewise, if you feel, if you don't want to answer now, reach out to me on Twitter uh, at Hi Joe, and I'll be happy to talk there. Uh, hi, Joe. <laughs> Thanks for the informative session. Uh, I think it was really good. Uh, we do have a few questions on the comments, so I'll just highlight them for you. Cool. Um, so in the case of wild in use, if foreground service gets killed and it restarts with an app in the background, then it will have access to that permission. Oh, that's a good one. Um, I don't know for sure. Um, if the foreground service gets killed and it restarts, I, I'd have to check. I presume so, um, but I don't want to give you any false information. Um, yes. I, I would presume it would still be uh, available for use because the foreground service would essentially still be running. Um, that would be a good one to test, and um, maybe that's a good one for um, the Google team to answer if if there's any opportunity to. Um, yeah, so not for, completely sure on that. Um, you could ask them back to back, I guess. Um, I would avoid, yeah, I would avoid asking them together. Um, like on Android 11, we can't anyway. Um, but yeah, there is, if, as long as you give the reason, like the, the right explanations, um, personally, it would feel to me a bit, um, intrusive. Like, you know, if we get asked permission after permission, it could be a bit annoying. Um, so yeah, if it, I'm trying to think of a, re a reason why you might need that, um, my advice would be ask them where they're required. So ask, ask for the foreground permission where it's required. And then when you need the background permission, ask it. Um, if there is a case where you need them both at the same time, then I guess you'd have to do that. And that, that would be fine. But in any way where you can ask them separately where they're required and maybe try and, because then if you ask them where they're required, you can have that time constraint between the two. Um, there isn't any restraint in terms of developer and development, but in just thinking of the user experience there. Um, as, far I'm, as far as I'm aware, uh, no, these, a lot of these changes are, um, are required for Android 11 and shouldn't have any, uh, any impact on Android 9 and 10. As always, uh, do test your apps on different Android versions after adding support for these newer things, to be sure. That's not something I've used. Um, again, I'm not I, I'm not a heavy user of deep links in development. Um, not something I've used too much. Um, the main reason for these intents is to provide a good um, implementation approach for deep linking when it comes to to launching URLs. Um, yeah, I haven't got too much to comment there because that's not something I've really used. Uh, again, there's nothing about that specified in the documentation, um, so that could be something to to play around with uh, if it's something you're using applications and, and see how that behaves. Um, not from a privacy point of view. I know there are some accessibility changes in Android 11. Um, be worth checking out the, the, the developer preview site for that. Um, I can't remember what they are, but there are some accessibility changes. They're not huge changes, but I remember there being some coming up for Android 11, uh, mainly improvements and, and a few uh, subtleties to, to offer a better experience. But in terms of privacy, um, I didn't, didn't spot anything there. Uh, okay, I think uh, we'll end the Q&A for now. Uh, Joe's uh, Twitter handle is available to all of you. So if you have any questions, as he has said earlier, you can reach out to him. Uh, thanks, Joe, for joining us and giving us this deep dive into Android privacy. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Cool. Great. Cheers. Cool. Okay. Yeah, bye. Yeah. Uh, okay, so with this, uh, we are going to end our session for today. Uh, one quick update that uh, a lot of GDGs around India are also doing uh, Android 11 meetups. So there is this site uh, where all the 
uh, events are available through GDG, Coimbatore, Chennai, and Nagpur. So you can attend these sessions uh, later, uh, they on 27 June, 4 July, and etc. Uh, we are also going to do future meetups. Uh, so our CFP forms are available. So if anyone wants to, uh, you know, talk about anything in our future meetups, do fill those CFP forms. Uh, we are available on meetups, Slack and Twitter. So if you have any feedback or do you want to share anything with us, uh, do share with us on these channels. So with this, I'm going to end this session. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. Bye.